We didn't know it was the PQ-17. We were stationed in Vyinga, and we received an order to sail towards Tirpitz, who had allegedly gone to sea and was sinking transport vessels one by one. So we were to head for Tirpitz and fight her. German intelligence discovered that the Allies were to send another convoy to the Soviet Union. The convoy was named under the Allied naming system PQ-17. But we also knew that the thorn in the German side was the equipment. So this was to be a classic demonstrative defeat of an Allied convoy. The first sea lord ordered all surface ships of the convoy to concentrate on a certain point. In other words, they were to leave the convoy. To head for Tirpitz and fight her. And every half hour, the commander was reporting, Tirpitz is that many miles away. And then, one wonderful day, he reported this. And then suddenly we were informed that Tirpitz had changed course and was heading back home. For the German battleship, Further participation in the mission made no sense. It was too prodigal to send a battleship to chase and sink merchant ships one by one. Besides this, the German command realized that British warships had left the convoy to focus as many forces as possible on finding and destroying Tirpitz. The battleship had already been spotted by Allied reconnaissance aircraft, and the threat to the ship was real, because large forces of the British fleet were nearby. Unprotected and scattered, Convoy PQ-17 was to be finished off by German aviation and submarines. Now you can imagine how the sailors and the Allied vessels began to feel once they realized that they had been left to fend for themselves, no longer able to rely on anybody else for protection. Worse, these were mainly slow, unarmed steamers with predominantly civilian crews. Now, certainly the sailors realized when they signed on that it was not going to be a picnic, but neither were they expecting the hell that was to follow. I think that everybody that served on the Russian convoys felt that they was doing the right thing to help the right people. The destruction of PQ-17 began on the 5th of July 1942. The Germans were methodically searching the sea for the scattered ships and sinking them one by one. It is July 1942. The Soviet troops are suffering disastrous defeats, heavy losses near Kharkov, the Germans are capturing the Crimea. Sevastopol is about to fall. Every tank, every gallon, every drop of oil, every aircraft mattered to us. And when they gave this order to scatter the convoy, for us, I don't know what to call this. It's something that makes your heart ache, a tragedy for all Soviet people. Because of this lost convoy, thousands and thousands of Soviet people lost their lives. Together with the convoy's vessels, 430 tanks sank to the bottom of the Barents Sea. To put this into perspective, in July 1942, the Soviet Army had about 400 tanks on the entire Stalingrad front. 
210 aircraft lost together with PQ-17 accounted for one-third of the Red Army's air force that operated in July 1942 near Stalingrad. The Soviet Army didn't receive 3,350 cars, almost 1,000 more than the Stalingrad front had at its disposal. We were ordered to search for the transport vessels and escort them to Arkhangelsk, Molotovsk, and Murmansk. From July 9th through July 11th, five merchantmen and several escort ships from PQ-17 arrived in Arkhangelsk. Nobody wanted to believe that only one-seventh of the vessels survived. Everyone still had hope. Those who went on search missions hoped to find the survivors. The people floating in boats and on rafts, frozen and exhausted, hoped they would be found. And they were found, almost all of them. Over the following two weeks, another six vessels arrived at Arhangelsk, both towed and on their own power. When convoy PQ-17 left port, it included 35 merchant ships. Only 11 of them reached Soviet shores. We saved a lot of people, about 40 people, who were left at sea during the voyage of convoy PQ-17. And about all they could say was, it was rather rough, it was rather cold, yeah. And we survived, yeah. But they never said much about it, yeah. And then we find out that the admiral, who was in command of all this, simply ordered the merchant ships to scatter, saying, save yourself if you can. For us, it's hard to understand the behavior of the British, and we'll never understand it from a human point of view. But from their experience of fighting convoys, the British did everything quite logically. From the 17th century, the tactic was the following. If an enemy fleet shows up, you must focus on destroying it. As soon as the enemy fleet has been destroyed or forced to retreat, the ships will sail without any hindrances and with minimal losses. That's the logic behind convoy duty. This was precisely the thinking behind the British actions around PQ-17. A primary threat had put to sea, was vulnerable, and the British were going to gather the forces to destroy it. The tragic events of convoy PQ-17 demonstrated to the Allies that the enemy was smart, strong, and ruthless. Fighting them was difficult, so they should continue the war until the very end. Though the Admiralty's actions were subject to sharp criticism from Moscow, both Great Britain and the Soviet Union realized that they needed to join forces to defeat the enemy, and a lack of trust would only make the Allies weaker. In early September of 42, convoy PQ-18 set off. And this time before sending it, the Allies did some pretty thorough planning. They changed the convoy route, they changed port of departure, they upgraded the escort, they provided an aircraft carrier, HMS Avenger. Nevertheless, the convoy was still subjected to fierce attacks and lost 12 merchantmen. And worse, the White Sea Throat, the most dangerous part of the voyage, was still ahead. This was essentially our last battle. The battle near Cape Canyon Nos. The Nazis sent torpedo bombers there. In 
September 1942, the future of the entire northern supply route was decided by Convoy PQ-18. Convoys from Britain to the Soviet Union were labeled PQ. The return convoys had a reverse index, QP. On September 13th, when Convoy PQ-18 had traveled the majority of the way, Convoy QP-14 left Arhangelsk. It included some of the surviving vessels from PQ-17. Now, they had been kept there for some time, pending information to find out what the future held in store, but finally had the opportunity to return home. Ordinarily, the return trip was much safer. The Germans preferred to concentrate their attacks on heavily loaded merchantmen going the other way, delivering supplies to the Soviet Union. However, on this occasion, the Germans decided that they were going to attack anything that they found. Coming for the convoys coming from Russia to England, they never, they never, never bothered with the merchant ships. They went for, they went for all, and all cruisers. They were, they were, from their point of view, they were doing the right thing, sort of thing, you know. The Allied convoys were simultaneously fighting off fierce enemy attacks in two Arctic regions. Convoy PQ-18, escorted by Soviet destroyers, was fighting its way through the White Sea Throat to Arhangelsk. Our commander, Anton Iosivovich Gurin, fired the main battery. Since they were flying to us at a low altitude, we could fire at them effectively. The aircraft was swept away, five inches. I don't want to lie. We shot down two or three aircraft in this battle. Twenty-seven ships of convoy PQ-18 reached Soviet ports. The equipment they brought was immensely important for the troops. Very soon, it was saving the lives of Soviet soldiers and contributing to the overall victory. But there are no entirely happy stories at war. Convoy QP-14, which was carrying people back home, was attacked. The Somali was torpedoed, uh, and Captain Onslow, our captain, decided to tow the Somali back to the United Kingdom, back to the UK. And we got the towing ropes across, and uh, the, a connecting line, a telephone line, and everything, and we towed her for oh, two or three days, actually, in the way, and, and we thought, good, we're gonna save this ship. And uh, then we hit a ferocious storm, and it was like so bad I couldn't describe it. It was one of the worst storms I'd ever experienced with mountainous waves, you know, 60 feet high and this, the, the, the big rolling waves. And, it, and the blizzard was blowing a blizzard 60 mile an hour gale, and it was snowing, the visibility was absolutely horrendous. You couldn't describe it. And uh, the tow rope parted, and the poor Somali, she broke her back, because she'd been torpedoed, you see. And she broke, broke her back. And in our searchlights, we could see the bows sticking up, and the, and the stern, like a V, sticking out of the sea. We tried so hard to save as many of the crew as we could, and uh, it was, it was a, a, an awful experience. On the 22nd of September 1942, Convoy QP-14 made port. Besides a British destroyer, they also lost the American merchantman Silver Sword, which was a survivor of the PQ-17 run. 
You can only imagine the feeling of the personnel aboard to include uh, those who had lost their ships as well, they were passengers, when they were torpedoed a mere few days short of their objective. The outstanding valor and bravery of the sailors aboard PQ-18 and QP-14, as well as their success in delivering the cargo, showed that the northern route was still necessary and, if correctly planned, very feasible. Throughout the rest of World War II, tragedies like that of PQ-17 were never repeated. The Allies gained military dominance in the north, and all following attacks on the convoys ended in great losses for the Germans. Allied vessels reached Soviet ports safe and sound. I went along to a couple of the sessions I had, given the Ashkov Medal to uh, the Arctic Convoy veterans, and they felt so proud. Yeah. Of course, the share of supplies sent for your Arctic convoys during the whole war is quite small. But their role was considerable, because they were carried out in the right place and on time. This has been a key strategic idea since Napoleon times. They were all fighting against a common enemy, and they all had to help each other out to win. The Soviet Union made huge contributions to the final victory, and as far as the convoys were concerned, it wasn't merely the equipment that mattered, but also the knowledge that they weren't fighting alone. If we hadn't have done it, we would never have won the war. And, and I hate to think what, what, would ha what would have happened. <laughs>